Well, welcome. And thanks again for being here for our continuation of the Know Your Community series here at the Working Men's Institute. Uh, tonight's a special one. Of course, they're all special, right? But we're very happy to have Kent Schutte here uh, talking about the Robert Lee Blaffer Foundation. How many of you have heard of the Blaffer Foundation? Assuming that you're all here, maybe you'd like to know a little more about the Blaffer Foundation, right? Well, Kent Schutte first uh, visited New Harmony in 1981. Who remembers that year? I vaguely do. <laughs> He's an architect uh, for construction and design firm. Um, he did the Cathedral, Labyrinth, and the Sacred Garden in 1996. He joined the Blaffer Foundation Board of Directors in 2002. He served on the Building and Grounds Committee, the Endowment Committee, the Arts and Artifacts Committee, and the Nominating Committee. He was just elected last Friday to a new five-year term on the Board of Directors. So fortunately, Kent, you're not going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> he purchased his current house in 2002 and moved here uh, permanently to New Harmony in 2018 upon retirement from Purdue University. So let's give a good WMI welcome, our friend Kent Schutte. Well, welcome. Um, the Robert Lee Blaffer Trust was established in 1958 in Houston, Texas, and it was in honor of Jane Blaffer Owen's father. Uh, it's resided in Texas until uh, 2002 when it became the Robert Lee Blaffer Foundation, which was now housed under uh, Indiana law. Uh, and it's uh, a 501c3 charitable trust. Uh, the foundation is 64 years old. Um, it meets twice a year. They have a May annual meeting, which we had last Friday, and then they have a fall budget meeting in November. So the board actually only comes together twice a year. But we have a lot of committee activity that goes on all year long. Um, the, currently, the board is made up of nine members. Uh, the newly elected officers last Friday are Kent Parker is the new chairman. Uh, vice chairman is Jamie Coleman. Uh, the secretary is Eric Arneberg. And the treasurer is Dosey Lewis, who's among us tonight. Uh, additional directors um, of the foundation are Annie Owen, uh, Sherry Ann Stanley, John Streetman, uh, Abigail Owen Pontes, uh, new last name, which I can't, I can't pronounce it either. Anyway, she just married this last year, and myself, so that, that's the nine. Um, now, the purposes in the Articles of Incorporation and the bylaws are kind of lengthy, and I want to read it to you because it's really an amazing uh, variety of things that Jane set up for the foundation to do in and around New Harmony. Uh, the purpose of the trust or corporation is to, um, I, can't, I can't read, formed are, the, the corporation has been organized exclusively for charitable, religious, scientific, literary, or educational purposes. Uh, the primary purpose of the corporation is to preserve Pr pr promote and support financially or otherwise the various historical and educational attributes of the town of New Harmony, including without limitation to promote and encourage historical research relative to New Harmony, to acquire by purchase, gift, demise, or otherwise title to or custody and control of historic locations and structures in and around New Harmony. I have lazy eyes and I thought that that would be enough light and I'm having a little trouble. But anyway, um, my eye doctor said, well, you have a flashlight in your pocket, but I didn't bring my phone, so I'm kind of in trouble. Um, uh, and in and around New Harmony and preserve and protect buildings and sites of historic interest in and around New Harmony to collect and preserve records, artifacts, and other 
things of historic interest related to New Harmony, to mark places of historic interest and to in and around New Harmony and uh, place suitable monuments and markers and foster and promote public knowledge and interest, oh, thank you, in New Harmony history. So that's what we can do. It's pretty much anything. Uh, there are four management committees. Um, uh, management committees can make decisions within the budget without the concurrence of the entire board of directors. In other words, we have the ability within a management committee to move money around, make decisions to do things over the course of the year that may not have been uh, directly presented to the full board of directors. So the finance budget and investments is one of the four. They handle the investments, the budget, and our IRS compliance. Um, the corporation, in order to remain uh, non-taxed, it must spend two-thirds of 5% of its asset holdings on a rolling five-year period. So um, this the last year, we had a semi-crisis. If you recall, during COVID, um, there was concern, I think Exxon stock dropped down into the 30s, and there was concern that they might uh, table a dividend, which is our primary source of operating revenue. And so in the budget in November, we froze a lot of accounts and said we don't know. And then the dividend came through, and then the stock went from the 30s to the 80s, which meant by October, we realized we had to spend a whole lot of money in a hurry, which is bad management. We're not happy about that. Uh, you will notice that there's been a lot of activity at the David Dale Owen Community House, which will be opening soon, and we really uh, put our eyes on that building and uh, redid the kitchen. Uh, Kurt Schmidt did the cabinets that are beautiful, and we redid portions of the floor, we drywalled it, uh, got the uh, cigarette smoke out of it, almost, um, from our dear friend Clem. But uh, so that uh, the building and grounds committee is uh, another management committee, and it has under its authority the Jane Blaffer Owen Sanctuary, which we'll talk about, I'll talk about in a minute. But we basically meet monthly as a committee of six of the nine directors. Uh, the president usually sits in as an ex officio member and we review uh, each property and what's critical, what's not critical, what, you know, how, how do we uh, juggle the numbers to keep things looking as good as we can. The third committee is Carroll's Garden, which was separated from Building and Grounds and it's managed by the family uh, as a separate uh, garden. And then the last committee is the Insurance Committee, which is a, a complex thing dealing with uh, value of the art, artifacts, the buildings, the grounds, which co constantly change. There are six advisory committees. Now they advise the board, so that means uh, they do not have the authority to make decisions without the concurrence of the board of directors. And those uh, are arts and artifacts. Uh, we have an uh, archive in the Tillich um, archive, which is the uh, brick portion of Mother Superior there on Main Street and uh, and then we have uh, Endowment and Development Committee, a Grants Committee, Jane Blaffer Owen Lecture Series, which we are going to start up again this year after COVID, which closed us down for two years. The Jane Blaffer Owen Scholarship, we give away a scholarship within the county every year uh, to um, deserving uh, graduating senior and then we have a special events planning committee well, to plan any special events that the board so chooses to launch now you recall we did a rededication of the gates at the Rufus Church on its 50th anniversary and we rededicated Tillich Park on its 50th anniversary um, that's a kind of special event we're talking about um, the value of the foundation's investments you ready for this um, as of March 31st, 2022, it was eleven million eight hundred and forty-six thousand nine hundred and sixty-four dollars and thirty ninety-four cents. So it's um, it's been what? It's 
up as of yesterday's report. Okay. Well, and you can see that's it's quite a game we play. Uh, the annual budget, which we um, set at in the, uh, November, is between three hundred and eighty thousand and four hundred thousand, and that takes care of all of the operating costs, the utilities, uh, all of the uh, maintenance on the buildings. Plus, we try to uh, include a hundred thousand for capital improvements. Um, but that's the one to dry up first because the others are all pretty necessary. Um, and just for reference, in 1984, looking back, I was looking back through some of the annual reports, the trust equity in 1984 was $1,382,843. So it's been quite a growth um, over the years. As you all know, the primary donor of the foundation was Jane Blaffer Owen, uh, who died on June 21st, 2010, 12 years ago. Uh, in May of 2014, the board of directors established by a unanimous vote the Jane Blaffer Owen Sanctuary, which consists of the gardens and grounds of the foundation's holdings. And, um, that was uh, initiated, actually, when I was teaching the senior urban design class at Purdue at the time, and two of my seniors wanted to do a New Harmony project. So they actually created um, and created this book, which we had copies for each of the board members, and was how we stimulated uh, them into um, creating a sanctuary. And I, I have a small copy here, which uh, we can circulate later on. But uh, this was really an important um, decision by the board. And it was made at the May meeting. And then that November, they created what's called the Friends of the Jane Blaffer Owen Sanctuary, which is a donor-based uh, group, which uh, we keep track of uh, <clears throat> when people make an annual gift uh, we keep it cumulative. I've got a book, and everybody's cumulative give, giving is in that book. And uh, I have enough of these for everybody to, to look at, and we'll want to kind of go over it. So let me take a minute. And that's easy. Reading a little bit from it. Uh, During her lifetime, Jane Owen revived the harmonious spiritual landscape and endowed it with her own vision. Jane Owen believed that a positive impact of nature could move a secular site into the realm of a spiritual landscape, a sacred place. Her efforts spanned 60 years in New harmony. In the sanctuary, Ms. Mrs. Owen created or restored eight structures, four fountains and water features, 11 gardens, and 10 outdoor sculptures. The spiritual landscapes and sacred places she left this community must now find renewed leadership in order to be sustained, protected, enhanced, and moved to forward into the next century. So when you open it up, um, uh, Janet Lawrence, who's here, laid this out. She did a great job. It'll walk you around the holdings which uh, make up the sanctuary and tell you a little bit about each one. So uh, we try to have these available. Um, and uh, it's a, a, an important program. So um, Can I add one more thing? Yeah. Our website, robertlingfoundation.org, <coughs> has detailed descriptions of all of these same buildings in the section. Yeah. So, the website? Yeah, which Dosi worked hard on, by the way. Yeah. It's been updated pretty good. Okay, um, the cumulative total of the donations to the sanctuary um, from 2014 to 2022 is $1,617,922, which came from 61 donors. So it's, it's, it really has been a significant <coughs> program. And I think you'll all agree that the gardens are looking better than they've ever looked, and we have more ability to, to keep them up than we had 
prior to the creation of the sanctuary. Um, now, there were three major gifts in that total. Uh, one was when Eric Arneberg's mother passed, uh, Jane Dale Owen, in her will, she left a million dollar endowment to the Jane Blaffer Owen Sanctuary specifically. So that's kept separate from the other funding of the foundation and uh, we use the income, interest income off of that to, to uh, augment the uh, landscape um, program in the sanctuary. Eric Arneberg has uh, donated $367,000 and Jimmy Coleman, who was Carol Coleman's husband, Carol's garden, who passed away two years ago, invested $143,000 in the gates, in the reno renovation of the gates to the Rufus Church, and in the renovation of Carol's garden. Um, so that's been very important. Um, the other brochure, which I have, is the foundation brochure. Um, uh, this focuses on the buildings, not the grounds. Uh, and you'll see when you look through it. Um, we have holdings that are overnight accommodations. We have holdings where you gather, work, teach, and learn. And we have holdings, gardens for uh, gathering in for events and then sacred places. So uh, if you open it up, you'll see under the main map that it gives you the um, overnight occupancy, the maximum event occupancy, and uh, availability. Um, so, and each of the guest houses kind of has a little, uh, we have three of them, uh, not counting the, the, the Barn Abbey, which is, sleeps 28 and it's our largest overnight facility but we have mother superior um, and she is uh, available to theologians philosophers musicians writers and friends of the foundation available to rent daily weekly or monthly um, the uh, poet's house is available to writers, poets, musicians, playwrights, and friends of the foundation. And its availability to rent is daily, weekly, or monthly. Um, the, there's been a change on the map since uh, it was printed. Uh, it says here that the Owen Community House um, is available for public activities approved by the New Harmony Artists Guild. We've actually, as the foundation, taken that back. They have access to use it, but we're broadening it to many other organizations that would come to us and ask to uh, use the facility. And then the um, third one is the gatehouse. Um, and the gatehouse, where's the gatehouse? It's available to um, artists and craftspersons, musicians, and friends of the foundation. And it's available again to rent daily, weekly, or monthly. Now, one of the things that we're working hard to integrate into our contribution to the town, and Dosi's played a keen role in this, leading the board in developing an artist in residency program. And the first artist uh, group that we focused on were ceramic artists because we have the Sarah Campbell Blaffer Studio. And that means we went to Lenny Dowie, University of Southern Indiana, retired, very well-known national potter, ceramist, and uh, he's done a remarkable job of bringing significant emerging ceramists and significant retreading ceramists who might be older wanting to come back and, and regenerate, refire, uh, no pun intended there. Uh, so uh, what's really nice about my talking now is in the next week, if you go to the Contemporary Gallery on Main Street, University's Gallery, you will see the show of the seven artists who participated in this year's uh, Artist in Residency program. 
Um, they're all women. Mm. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but they're, they're all incredible, and uh, you'll get a good idea of the quality of, of what has happened here. Now, what's amazing is when we started it, we said we hoped that they would each leave us with a piece of the work they created while they were here, and they have. And so we've developed this extraordinary collection of ceramic art, uh, which we're going to have to start finding a place to store it. Um, but there have been over 33 artists. I, I may be off a little, but uh, we went into a hiatus during COVID when we couldn't have people in the program. But I think I got a pretty good count on those who came before that happened and added the seven for this year. And it's remarkable. Um, we've had people here in residency from 27 uh, American states, 27 artists, and they've come from, to us from 27 different states. Um, and we've had one from China, one from Romania, one from India, and two from Denmark. So it's really been a, a wide variety of participants in the program. Um, so the next thing that comes along then is how do we grow that program? Uh, when the original building was built, it was built to be a teaching facility and an exhibition space. And then we generated this incredible artist in residency program. They come in and occupy the space. Well, how do you teach and how do you exhibit? Uh, you can't clear them out every two weeks to do something. They're in there and they have their space. Um, so um, Eric Arneberg uh, decided uh, that he wanted, uh, through his own contributions to the foundation, to study this. First of all, he was quite concerned that the pottery studio looks the way it looks today, because when he was a young man, it looked like this. It was designed by Richard Meyer, uh, and it doesn't look like this anymore. Uh, before we painted it in off-white, it was, uh, I called it a Taco Bell. It kind of looked like a Taco Bell. It was a pale, fleshy Taco Bell color. So Eric wanted to bring back the essence of what the building originally was, but then also to create studio spaces for the artists that would overlook the valley and move them out of the old building adjust the old building towards uh, the Lentz house by adding more storage in our office on that back elevation. And so he went to Bernard Hart, who was Richard Meyer's 30 year plus managing partner, and came up with the conceptual design for a new building here and the renovation of the old building. So actually, you can see the new building on your left at night and how the old building would be re reframed uh, by the renovation on the right. Um, and from the air, Now, if we could get this done, and that's a big if, um, I think we would put that program in international um, focus as probably one of the primary artists and residency programs in the world for ceramics. Um, we're not there yet on these things. You move forward a little bit. You don't move back, you pause. And then after a pause, you move forward a little bit more, you hope, and then you pause. But you don't fall back. And maybe in my lifetime, uh, something like this will happen. But if not, we'll pause and we'll move forward eventually. Um, so uh, I think that's pretty much my program. Uh, 
the next group of artists that we want to try to focus on, uh, Dosi's very much involved in textiles, and Peggy Taylor, who is here among us, has opened her weaving school and is teaching. Uh, the stuff on the back of the room is one of her senior citizen classes. Uh, I think there are people in the room that participated in that class. And we have the looms, we have the talent, we just got to get the space. And once we do that, then we'll be able to launch an artist in residency program uh, with, tech, with textile artists from around the world, which is our, our hope. And, and then hopefully find a way in the future to add painters and writers and poets. Um, kind of my scheme is to have this town achieve excellence but remain small. How do you do that? Well, you don't have events with 40,000 people and remain small. But when you can get a group of seven or eight outstanding artisans of different uh, disciplines coming here, you become a sabbatical community. You become a significant regeneration place that accommodates the scale of the town. And uh, I'm really hoping that we can see that happen and have quality events come here that being reinforced because we've had quality artists here. Um, so that's any questions? Susie. Be kind, be kind. Do you have any ongoing uh, events that brings money into the uh, sanctuary on a small scale? Well, I'm starting a tour. Is that what you're getting at? <laughs> okay. Um, the uh, New, Har New Harmony project last year when, when David brought his group um, actually it happened at the farmer's market. I had given a walk to somebody and, and they said to me, you know, you really ought to write a book. And I said, yeah, well, I've talked about that for 20 years and I can't get it done. And she said, but I've got the title for your book. And I thought, really, well, what is it? I even wrote it down on the, the sheet from the market that day. She said, I think it ought to be titled Silence, Secrets, and Shadows. And I thought about that, and Jane actually planned significant shadows at night for some of the sculptures and the, in the gardens uh, that are remarkable. And most people don't queue up on that. They don't see that. So I've been giving tours informally to various groups. Um, uh, David has asked me to do it again for the New Army Clay Project. I did the uh, Lawyers Institute, Indiana L Law Institute, a couple weeks ago. I did Big Car, uh, which was a symposium here. And I don't make any money doing this, but they generally do make a donation which goes into the sanctuary. So I'm hoping to develop that um, to where there can be others who could do the tour and we can, you know, because nobody really, it's not anybody's fault, but when you look at USI and you look at the state of Indiana's holdings here in New Harmony, they are all from the two utopian experiments. They're, they're either properties that were built by George and Frederick Rapp, or they're properties that were here uh, during the McClure-Owen period. Uh, Jane didn't come along until 41, and so there's a, a whole Jane Owen experience here which is not theirs to tell really and it's all the places that people really come here for the labyrinth tillich park carol's garden the rufus church all of these sacred sites that's people where people are and so i think it's a real opportunity to develop her story uh, and it's really a special thing to do at night because it's so quiet and so perfect uh, for a walk. Uh, any other? Yes, Linda. There's a 
work going on at the ceramic studio because there's a dumpster there? Uh, yeah. So what is, what, is, what is that? Well, we had a very, very exuberant artist who was here and he was producing like crazy. And so the electric kilns were going 24 seven in a room without enough ventilation to pull the heat out and effectively melted part of the roof. So we're repairing. And so we are putting a new roof on the existing building because it needs it. I don't think it'll be uh, uh, ripped off as we proceed if this goes forward. But yeah, it's a, it's a necessary repair. Bigger fan and better rules about how you use the electric kilns. <laughs> So, so that we don't get snookered again, but, uh, yes, Do you have a grant program for historic buildings in town? Uh, when I came on the board uh, in 2002, uh, the foundation was still doing quite a bit of granting uh, of their annual income. Um, they gave money to the Evansville Symphony Orchestra. They gave money to the school. They gave money to a lot of things. And the board, with the passing of Jane, who could never fill the gap, you know, if you ever got in trouble with the budget, you went to Jane and you got a donation to fill the gap, okay? Well, we didn't have that. Where is she? I don't see her anymore. So we had to retreat uh, because the properties have to be maintained. And we were falling behind on maintenance of the properties because we were giving away too much money uh, to various organizations. So what we kind of use as a standard is we still have some which we've been giving to for many years, like the New Harmony Project. They bring uh, 30 writers and playwrights here uh, two consecutive weeks in New Harmony. That puts heads in the beds, as Annie Owen says. And it does add to the economic vitality of the town. Um, we support the Dalsimer Chautauqua. Uh, now, we don't support it as highly as we did, but we still support it, you know. Um, and um, so the list is smaller, but the list is significant. Um, various events. Dosie, I can't. But we do have in-kind use. It's not a cash outflow, but there's in-kind, uh, designated in-kind nights in each of the guest houses. So like, um, if we have a significant individual, I'll give you an example. I got a call from Richard uh, McCoy in Columbus, and he said the particular editor of the uh, American Express black card holders did you know they had a black card? I didn't know they had a black card. I thought gold was as good as it got. Well, if you spend more than 250000 a year with American Express, they offer you a black card. You don't, you don't apply for it. They offer it to you. They actually put a magazine out quarterly to their black card holders. So here the editor of that magazine is stopping in Columbus, and Richards agreed to work her into the schedule to come and experience New Harmony, so I get this call. So there's an example, I call Dosi, we get the form, we fill out the form, what's the purpose? How is the town benefiting? Well, having her here for two days, staying in the gatehouse, um, got an article in that magazine, which gets the word out uh, to a whole level of 
spenders that we want to know about New Harmony. So those are the kind of in-kind things that happen. Um, a, a particular artist, we have one coming next week. Um, Friday. Friday. He's, yeah, but he's yeah he's also an artist in residence. He's a stone cutter and uh, has worked on the Roosevelt Monument, significant monuments uh, for the government and for um, all over the place. He's from Newport. He was a good friend of Luke Randall, and so that's one of the reasons we uh, invited him to come. Um, any other questions? So I hope that helps you understand what we're trying to do, and uh, we appreciate everything. I look out in the audience and I see friends of the sanctuary. So thanks again for all you, all you do, and uh, thank you for having me. So. Thanks again, everyone, for coming tonight for our program. Uh, we're almost halfway through May already. Who can believe that? But we still have a number of events here at the Working Men's Institute this month. Uh, tomorrow, 6.30, Karen Moser will be talking about teen girls then and now, from the Minerva Society to the Sunshine Club. Karen was last year's recipient of the Lena Finer Memorial Research Grant for Women's Studies, uh, a generous grant made possible by the Ephraimson Family Foundation. So please uh, come and see what uh, a year's worth of research has uh, resulted in tomorrow night's lecture. May 17th, which was alluded to a few minutes ago, 7 p.m., odd time for, for the WMI, 7 p.m., artist in residence for the Blaffer Foundation, Nicholas Benson. He is a stone cutter. He's a stone engraver. He's going to be giving a presentation here um, on the 17th. On May 18th, the next night, so we have two weeks of back-to-back uh, -back, um, programming, 6.30, the Friends of the Working Men's Institute are going to have Rod Clark talking about the world of whiskey. We expect a full house for that one. And May 25th, uh, very special, just in time for Memorial Day, uh, WMI uh, Vice President Nathan Maudlin will be talking about Utah Beach and the D-Day invasion. So please um, consider coming to any and all of those events. Later on in June, Connie Winesapple is going to be talking about France during the COVID pandemic. Uh, June 29th, continuation of this very series, Know Your Community, Amy Cook from the Ford Home is going to be uh, talking. So. Um, Please like us on Facebook, check out our calendar, and um, have any questions, always call us here at the Working Men's Institute. Let's give another uh, warm appreciation to Kent tonight. And two other final words, by all means, check out Peggy Taylor's uh, exhibit back there, Woven Together, and please leave with some popcorn. Thank you so much.